Good, good evening, everyone, and welcome to uh, the BMC production. And we're going to discuss this evening the 1500 meters. And I'd like to welcome Mark Hookway, uh, Norman Paul, Andy Anderson, James T. And our main uh, guest tonight is one of the all time greats globally, is Steve Cram. Welcome, Steve. Uh, and I think we'll get straight on with it then. And I would like to ask Steve um, if his attitude towards training has changed since he was an athlete and now he's a coach. Um, what I mean was when it, we start off with the winter training, which is, which is, which is the longest period, uh, not necessarily the most important period of the year, but uh, it is the longest period when we're, we're talking with many athletes right the way through from September to the end of March. Steve. Um, I, I don't think my attitude has changed. I, I think um, in terms of um, what I would you know, be trying to work with athletes on or, or uh, it, it's probably a bit different. We're in a completely different world now for athletes and coaches. Um, and so many things now to draw on, um, which weren't around, I hate saying this, 30 odd years ago, 40 years ago even, yeah. Um, so... You know a lot of things which um, have changed, but the the essence of, of, of I think what is required of a fifteen hundred meter runner hasn't changed that much. You know the, the the number one thing is to and you're alluding to kind of September to March. You know it is an endurance event that hasn't changed. Um, you know you people come on it from different backgrounds, and I think that's why I'd, I'd always put caveats in around. You know are you an eight hundred fifteen hundred meter runner? Or are you a a, a three, five k, fifteen hundred meter runner. And there, there are two different types of, of people who come to the event, if you like. And then, depending on um, the athlete you're working with, uh, it's you probably approach things a little bit differently. But the, the number one thing for me is you know never forget it's an endurance event, and um, for that reason, the building blocks that you put into place in it's a little bit different for me. I, I think I wouldn't you know. I think for most athletes, September is probably almost still part of, of the season, you know, the back end of the season. So my annual kind of um, cycle would, would really begin in October at the earliest. Um, so you're either resting late September for, for me and, and, and even uh, these days, I think October is often a, a bit more of a quiet month. So you really only start ramping things up in terms of training in November, December, January. And that three month block uh, is not very exciting. Um, and, and as I said, what, when I'd say, what, what are the differences now in my day, that would have been a pretty boring, um, you know, just running miles and never went on a track. Um, occasionally had the chance to go warm weather training at that time of year. Um, but generally speaking, it was still just about putting miles in and would have raced quite a lot back then would have run a lot of uh, as part of the training I, I, I guess but you know, there was there were local road races as you all know every weekend of a pretty high quality in terms of competition you didn't have to travel to find good races so that that has changed and a lot of athletes would be much more likely to fit their first altitude block in for instance in, in that you know pre, pre um, Christmas New Year and certainly straight into January. Um, that's where, if you haven't done it before, we'd love to get a first big block in going away. And that's really how we've worked in, in the last sort of 10 years. I've certainly worked with Laura. Um, so what hasn't changed, though, is that what you do at that period, let's say November through to February, uh, gives you the platform and gives you the, um, the foundations, if you like, for what everything that comes next. It's not to say that, that if that doesn't go, that time of the year doesn't go perfectly well, that you can't still have a good season out of it because you just, you've got to be creative about it, you know, where you shift and where you, but the, if, if you get a good block in there, it just gives you a little bit more flexibility in terms of what you can do sort of March through to uh, April, May, and then into the main part of the season as well. So, and, I, and I, I'll probably as well, because depending on where your questions go, I mean, I, I think it's quite interesting when you sort of said 
September to January, February, whatever, because again, my blocks are probably slightly different. And I think that was that's because my, you know, I, I went into a, a fairly high level straight away at 17, 18, and I've tended to always work to that timetable. What I mean by that is you're peaking in July, August, maybe into September, rather than running races in April and May, which you see a lot of these days. You know, and, and for a lot of athletes at a certain level, maybe the trials or the national championships in June are, are the pinnacle of the season. So it really depends on where you are, where you're trying to peak your season. Yeah. So for me, because I'm always looking at August as the season peak, what you know, how how that eight months, nine months, uh, or actually sort of 10, 11 months, I guess, we go to pre Christmas works is probably a little different than right. a lot of people would think. Okay, can I stop, stop you there? Um, Andy, can I ask you to now say what you do in, during this period? Because Steve never actually ran indoors, and you, you coach people for indoors as well as cross country, don't you? I do, yeah. Um, but how I work that though is, I mean, I, I just generally um, touch on race pace stuff to the guys going indoors. That I, I don't look at it as a, um, you know, a main part of the season, um, really. So um, I, I still do a, a fair bit of winter work where I can with the athletes. Um, that's how I try to work it. Um, so yeah, it, it's uh, main focus is the summer really um, for us, and I try to. Um, emphasize that with the athletes that we work with as well um, and I just look at it as a as a bonus to be able to compete indoors really for those that um, right. don't really enjoy the cross-country side of stuff. Okay uh, Mark, Mark you, you, you at Tunbridge one of the top cross-country clubs in the country big success over the years well done how does how does your winter work out bear in mind you're still looking at uh, sometimes people going on the track in, indoors and the summer season, but you, you yeah. do concentrate quite a lot on the country, don't you? Yeah, and we're very much a, a, a club, typical traditional sort of club, winter group sessions and things like that, where pretty much everybody can do the same, as Steve was saying, put that endurance background da down. <laughs> uh, I mean, Steve's been very good with a few of our runners at National Cross Country Championships. They know him well. They've had photographs with him and he was kind enough to do an interview at Mansfield once, twice, because they didn't press the record button. So that, that, was, that was quite good fun. <laughs> it's interesting what Steve said, because I've read about um, Steve, um, I don't know if it's your autobiography or a book of, or articles about your training, where, and something I incorporated was just, just once a month to drop in the 12 or 15, 400s off a minute, just to keep touch with a little bit of pace so it's not such a shock to the system when you come out of it and um, yeah it's all about long reps and steady runs and things like that for us but when we've been able to train as a group I've often incorporated that thinking yeah that's quite a good thing to do everyone can do it yeah you start slow in October and you just nudge it up every month a little bit and it was just quite a good way of going I'm glad about you do it Mark but I didn't do it I don't know where you read that <laughs> uh, um no, I mean, I think, so here's, here's where I have to try and get rid of some myth, if you like. Um, I know Norman was the one person who probably sat down with me and probably got the most accurate um, uh, view of, of how I train. I ran quick in the winter. Um, I did a lot of my mileage at, at, at your know, pretty quick pace. Um, we never went on the track. Um, that would be partly because I, we, you know, it, I, I trained at Jarrow. I mean, we, we're so lucky these days. And you've got to bear in mind that, you know, we didn't have a synthetic track. Uh, or we did at Gateshead, but, you know, that's like going, that was like going across the border. So you didn't go there. Um, and so, no, I grew up with this um, kind of, uh, uh, you know, basis of, of the track was... It was like the, the, going on the track became, you know, when I went on the track in March, it was like a reward. You know, you, you know what I mean? And, and every track session I did was, was, was an important session from then through to the summer. There were a lot of things that I see people doing on the track, and I'll be brutally honest, 
um, you know, I've, this, I've discussed this with, with, with Laura over the years. Some people want, and I think this is a coach thing as well, by the way. Um, it's easier for coaches to watch somebody doing, you know, five times a thousand meters around the track than it is to go out on a road somewhere when actually they're probably not running much quicker around the track than they would be if we were doing it on the road. Your question, though, was about kind of shorter stuff. And I think, yeah, I'm always intrigued by this because I see a lot of this, and Andy alluded to it a little bit as well, that in, in this one, this is why we really just come back to the athletes, the individual athletes who are coaching. Um, in... in um, people get very concerned that they won't be able to run fast again. You know, it seems that way. So we've got to keep in touch with it. That's the phrase, isn't it? Let's keep in touch with that. Um, and, and the idea that, that somehow, you know, if you don't do anything the next time you come to try and do it for whatever reason, it's going to take you longer to get down to race pace and all the rest of it. And I get that. I think it's a reasonably valid argument and it probably is more valid for some athletes than other athletes. Um, I've never found that anyone I've, you know, in my experience going back all those years and also people I've watched and, and, and certainly my experience with Laurie, that we've never, ever not been able to get fairly back fairly quickly to where what we'd expect to be yeah. Yeah. in March, April. I think, though, going on the track in the winter is psychologically sometimes good for people, you know, because it's different. Uh, the winter can be a slog, particularly in the UK. Um, it's nice if you're getting away warm weather training. Of course, it's good. You're, and if we go down to Poch now in January, February, the grass is great. You know, Poch is still in, in South Africa. And yes, because the track's there and it's sunny and it's warm, we'll go and do some, some track workouts. But I, I don't know what your, you, all the experience was for you guys last year, but I was really quite chuffed because... Um, Two things, and I'm sorry to go into this, but the two things happened just to kind of underline what I'm saying. We couldn't go on the track at all. There were no tracks. I mean, Hendo was managing to sneak onto one or two. I know he's sneaky devil, but um, you know, the, you, none of us around the country theoretically could go on track at a period of the year where you'd really want to be April, May. Okay. We couldn't go away altitude training, had to stay at home, couldn't travel anywhere. And yet, Laura produced some of our best stuff last summer, ran, ran PBs across the board um, without the kind of, and we talked a lot about it. I said, look, we can still do all the stuff we need to do. It just doesn't have to be on a track. It can be on, on a grass field. It can be anywhere. Good, and we can replicate other things and all the rest of it. And it was, it was a really good exercise, I felt, for a lot of athletes, and Andy might back this up, that athletes still ran well in the summer. We had, you know, a lot of people ran really, really well in the summer, from a, an unstructured approach compared to what they would normally have. So, yes, I, I think some of it's – I'm giving you long answers, aren't I? But some of it is about psychologically, I like going on the track once a month just to keep in touch with it. I'm not sure that physiologically it's as important as we, as we sometimes make it out to be. Okay. Can I, can I mention something there, Neville? Um, yeah. Obviously, I, I um, follow – so, uh, you won't be surprised here, a, a system is very similar to Steve. And, um, you know, my athletes, I've had the best results at 15 um, with athletes who follow a single periodized year. Um, but I do every two or three weeks to drop in, not 12 or 10 400s, maybe um, eight 400s. Athletes like it psychologically, as Steve said, there is an advantage there, but it's not an important session. They're not hitting this as fast as they would in the summertime. They're probably two or two, three seconds a lap per, per 400 slower. But they'll also maybe even uh, um, preempt this with maybe a, a 10 or 20 minute tempo you know, before the session. But it, it is just keeping them active. And they tell, they tell me that they, they do um, enjoy the session. But I just, um, on Steve's point, um, in many ways, uh, you know, as I say, Steve said he, he didn't go on the track at all. But if you think about this, the Saturday session, Steve, that you did, I think it might be worth reminding people of what you did because uh, there's quite a lot of these, especially towards the end of that session, you know, there's some really good quality in there. Which, uh, yeah, you but, okay. So you, you're referring to what, what we call the park session, which was a, yes, a yeah. park session, but it was in a, it was in a park that, that was hilly. Um, right. So it incorporated hill you're running on hills and it was up and down and 
and we did everything. <clears throat> it was a good hour long session, non stop, um, yeah. which began with four minute reps and just dropped down, dropped down, dropped down, dropped down. So four minute reps, three minute reps, two and a half minute reps, two minutes. They were kind of, you know, the four minute was like a lap, a big lap, and it was just, you know, anyway. And you're right. And then the very, it all came all the way back down to the last two sets were uh, like a 150 meter um, hill. That were not, not, we had a couple of really steep hills. So yeah, I should throw that in. Every long rep, four minute, three minute, two and a half, two minutes, finished on a hill, a 60 yeah. meter hill that was, uh, you almost needed crampons. Um, and you know, so it was, so, uh, but then you moved into the other bit of the session that then was quicker and faster. And, yeah. but it would end up with 150 uh, meter um, sprints and, and jog back. And then the very end was 60 meter turnabout. Yeah, so you would really be building up some lactate towards the end of that Massive one. Lactate, sure. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, that was the one session where uh, I never ever I never ever puked ever in training session, but lots of my friends did do yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, and I think you know that yes, but again, we wouldn't do that until sort of February onwards. We didn't yeah. really do that in in um, you know November, December, January. Um, so no, I you know, I as I said, look, every, I think the great thing about fifteen hundred meter running as I tried to point out right at the very beginning, is that you can come at it from slightly different um, perspectives and you probably still will get a reasonably good result. Understanding the athlete that you've got and what, what their requirements are. Obviously for me, I was going to perform better off this really good endurance background. It made me strong and it made me... And yes, I had to work hard to get the pace in there at, at a later point, but I didn't feel as though to do that, I had to yeah. keep running quick all the time. And whereas for other people, as you said, you know, Seb would run indoor seasons, um, less, less cross-country and all the rest of it, and different, a completely different physiological approach, if you like, from, from, you know, in terms of the type of athlete he was. Uh, and you could look at our, our current crop today, you know, I'd probably liken Jake Whiteman as close to my sort of background as, as, as any of the guys. Um, but you know, others are very different. And I, I, I'd go back to somebody like Mo. I mean, Mo is probably not a great example, but you know, Mo shows you, know, you can run 320, you can run really fast 1500 just from being really, really strong. Mm. Probably not going to win a championship medal, but if you're just talking about a flat out, fast, hard time with 1500 meters. Yeah. Yep. That endurance bit is the key there, isn't it? Because as long as it, you know, it's fairly even paced and you, you can you can you can deliver that. The, the trick, of course, is how do you turn your athlete into somebody who can do that and can also run fifty seconds for the last lap? Yeah, yeah. I I personally, my mine is similar in the early early seventies was doing, but uh, I I worked out a system where I would do lots of hilly reps. My theory was, well, one of the theories of practice was that you go up one side of the hill and you come down very quickly on the other side. So you're turning your legs over without them really, really sprinting or anything like that. And I agree, it does, it does build up a bit of lactate in the system. There's no doubt about it. Uh, Steve, you mentioned, you mentioned there it makes you strong. And I think that's right. And I think this is a part, part of the important period. Now, when I, I recently watched... Um, a CD of the great milers which you were involved in, and all of all of them, which was so obvious to to me and the way it was that everyone was really strong at the finish. They really, really came on really strong, and I think that uh, that that was important because I was always uh, with this coach I was with, and times I was with Fran Stanford, and he always said, "You've got to be strong." You've got to be strong. Always kept on about that. And I think, Norman, you've come up with some bit of research regarding the finishing speed of 1,500 metres as opposed to 800s. Well, I think it's pretty well known that, um, you know, these days, um, major championships, um, 800s are, you know, running very, quite quick times. But the last 100s, you know, are quite a lot slower than the rest of the race. And... Um, and in fact, I know that uh, quite a few, a lot of physiology work has been done proving that, uh, you know, most of the athletes are very much into an aerobic um, 
energy system um, in the latter stages of an eight. And uh, the last hundreds can, you know, can be a lot slower than they often are in championship 15s. I think one exception, I've got to say, Neville, is one exception. Matt was Steve himself in um, 1986 at the Commonwealth Games, the, the 800. I was there in the stadium and uh, couldn't believe how quickly Steve finished that. I think the last 200 was in the 24s. Which is quite remarkable. Yeah, in the this, because this is the, this is another rumor which is getting better. I love all this. It's good. I it, it it might have been a little bit slower than that, but I think the point you're making though is, and I keep coming back to this. No, Steve, I measured it. I've got the tape. Did you? Yeah. <laughs> right, well, all, all I know. No arguments. Is, no arguments, please. The race, the race you're talking about. I ran pretty much even pace. I ran. I think I ran fifty-one six, fifty-one five. Yeah. And therefore, it looks like. Yeah. And yes, you're right. Maybe around the last 200 in particular was um, very quick. Yeah. A bit windy down the back straight, if you remember. Um, so let's say it was 25 something. I don't know. And yes, that's quite unusual to finish an 800. But that was the way I had to run 800, generally speaking, even even when I was. So, which which is if you, it and it's really understanding that for I, I think that it's one of the things I get a little bit frustrated about these days. But I'm on the circuit a lot, talking to athletes and coaches and watching them race and, and I sometimes sit in the restaurants or bars afterwards and listen to somebody going yeah you know I just didn't get out hard enough and you go no you couldn't finish the last 150 meters of the yeah. race you know it wasn't because you didn't get out hard enough at all you know in fact you probably might have been better off you know anyway and for people to really understand really understand how their race is being put together and how it needs to be put together for them as individuals as well Yes, you're in a competitive environment where you inevitably get drawn into doing things you know, against your competitors that might not be exactly what you want. But, you know, it's pointless somebody who can't run. For me, if you can't run 47 seconds for 400 meters, going out in 48 and a half is, or 49 even is a bit silly, really, because you are going to be, as you said, you, in terms of the systems that you're trying to employ, you haven't got that buffer that somebody with that pace has. Of course, people who go out at that pace, are they going to be able to keep that going? You know, I once saw the wonderful Tony Morrell um, at Durham at Maiden Castle run 49 seconds for the first lap and 61 for the second lap. You know, and, and of course, how often do we see that? So the balance is really, if, if moving in 800 meter running, 1500 meter running is not, is not dissimilar in the sense that Understanding what your what your the, the parameters of what you can deliver are important. So here's here I'll, I'm I'm just going to throw this out there as as my number one thing when I talk to people about 1500 meters. If you want to run a good 1500 meters, you've got to have a decent 800 and a decent 3k. And your training, your training should mean that in May, if I want to run a decent 3k, I can do. And we can all argue about what that might be. That that will. And what you run for 3K and what you run for 8K, and I don't know how much research normally, but a few years ago, I did a whole bunch of this sort of stuff. And there's loads of it out there. And you'll find that somewhere in the middle of that, you'll get, you'll get a pretty good idea of what the person's going to, or what they could run for 50 Yeah, 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 I'd agree. Yeah. So you, you never, you you never went into the winter uh, looking at the 800 specifically. It was more a 1500 meter runner first. Me? Yes. Oh God, yes. Oh God, yes. I mean, the only reason I managed to run eight hundreds half decent in the end, really, was um, it's it's still an endurance event, you know. And actually, the faster I got, it sounds silly, the, the better an eight hundred meter runner I was because strength became more of a factor. So when I was trying to run one forty nine, and guys could just rip me up in the last two hundred meters because I, when I was I don't know how long it took me to break 150, but I, I think when I went to Commonwealth Games in when I was 17 or 18, I think I, I think my best was 152 or 153. My best. Yeah. Um, so, but as I got stronger and developed more as an athlete, and, and was able to maintain the pace that I had, little what little of it was of it, it got a bit better, and we worked on it. But you just come strong. So what it then meant was, although 52 was pretty hard. I could run another lap at that pace or close to that pace. Good, good. So. You talk, talk, talk about strength. Did you do 
uh, well, ask everyone really, specific strength work. I mean, uh, going on the weights or circuit training or whatever at this period of the year. Do we all do that? Where all the, like the, the, I mean, not all the, most, I mean, James and Andy know all this sort of stuff. And, and uh, you know, no is the short answer. Um, no? Oh, okay. I, I, was, I, wouldn't say I, didn't do, I wouldn't say never I didn't do anything. That would be probably to mislead people a little bit. But because um, I did have some like weights made. Uh, Jimmy, when he was working on the shipyards, got me these really, bit of, uh, they were maybe five kilogram. Um, that was partly because when I was 18, 19, I was so puny. And, and all, all I used to do with them was, was fairly basic, kind of just trying to get a little bit of upper body strength. But also, I used to more on night times, used to do a couple yeah. hundred of them who were waiting. Uh, calf raises, as everyone knows, you know, I ended up doing, oh, I don't know, I, I used to do five sets of 100 on each leg every night. Um, I would do press ups, I would do a few things like sick ups, nothing within a gym, it was all at home, in and around, um, you know, and, and going back to the type of training I was doing. And we've just touched on it. You know, when you're running hard miles up, up and down the hills of Tyneside, the fart leg sessions in a park on a Saturday and all that sort of thing, there is there's some in, in inherent essence in there. It's not what we would call the stuff today. And of course, had I been around today, I'm pretty sure I would have got injured less, would have been able to train even harder. Sure. Um, and would have taken full advantage of it. So yeah. for goodness sake, don't let anyone think that I'm saying you don't do it. Because had I had I come been around in, you know today, I'd be taking full advantage of all the knowledge there is around that now. Andy, do you go? Do your athletes go in the gym? Yep, they do. Um, so yeah, at least twice a week. Um, but on top of that, sometimes in the winter we also chuck in a circuit session as well. Um, and then also we look at. Um, drills, running drill sessions as well, um, because they kind of like look at that as a conditioning session in itself as well um, with the things that we do. So, so yeah, they spend a fair bit of time in the gym um, doing stuff and working on um, specific stuff as well as um, athletes specific uh, weaknesses as well. So, um, good, yeah. Good. yeah. Norman, Norman, yeah, but Well, um, circuit training, general conditioning, the sort of thing that Steve talks about, and um, if, you, if you like, uh, the, the sort of thing that George Gandhi developed um, many, many years ago. So that's the general conditioning once, at least once a week. But then by certainly by December, we're going into heavier weights and only senior athletes and those who've got the time. Time's a, you know, is a big problem. I don't run that session. I have um, you know, an Olympic level um, uh, weightlifting coach who assists uh, you know, my athletes with that. And, and, I, and I do believe, as, as Steve mentioned, um, that it can assist greatly in, uh, with injury prevention. So it's not just about being stronger. Yeah. OK, Mark, Mark, can I use the gym? Yeah, well, I mean, it's one thing we've really missed over the last year is getting together as a group. We used to hire a school gym, do circuit training there. But of course, that's been, well, I don't know when we last did it. It's over a year ago now, of course. I think... Um, but with senior athletes, which are principally my group now, um, yeah, they have to make do as best they could over the last year. And a lot, a lot of them are doing some yeah. conditioning work at home. Um, I've been so grateful for James Thee's uh, circuits. James has turned up here over the last year. And I can't tell you how many people I've recommended that to. Because yeah. Yeah. it doesn't require any equipment. It just in yeah. requires enthusiasm. And if even if you're watching the recording yeah. of James Monday session, I think it's helped so many people over the last year. Mark, you 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 coach one or two who athletes are in the states. Is there is their winter preparation different to ours? What Steve um, said and Norman. Well, typically they're in the NCAA system, so the cross country is followed by the um, the indoor season. So there's a there's a definite structure there that doesn't follow anything like what Steve was talking about or what we do traditionally over here. Um, and then it depends on, you know, <coughs> on, their, on their strengths, but typically Brits are taken on board in the NCAA system because they can run cross country, indoor and outdoor. So they're quite valuable to the uh, university teams out there. So that has a, obviously has a considerable bearing on how they operate. 
Good. Do they go into gym very much in the yeah, weight room? Very much so. You know, James West at Oregon would do a lot of gym work. And I think particularly, as Norman said, you know, as they get a bit older into their early 20s, they're very conscious of their weaknesses and a lot of dialogue with physios and people like that and, ass and assessments. They know what they've really got to work specifically on. So I think it's very, very important in that respect. Good, good. Uh, Steve, going back, you, you mentioned altitude, and I know that uh, uh, you used to go to Boulder. Um, I've been to Boulder as well. It was an excellent place, uh, really good. Uh, what's your feelings about that? Uh, if I had my time over, I would have gone and lived there um, or somewhere similar. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, I, I think, again, you know, what we now understand and what we, the knowledge that we've got is, is fantastic. Um, and even when we're not there using um, altitude tents and the rest of it, I think it should be for, for those who reach you know, the, the, the higher levels, uh, incorporating it into your training years. Is, is, if you can do it, it's important. But I will put the caveat, as I said, last year we didn't go because we couldn't go. Um, and yet, you know, we still had a fantastic year. So it's not essential but there's two elements or two or three things i think that it works <clears throat> um you, you've got to you've got to get to know you need a little bit of trial and error because everybody's different um and and you've also got to try and find out where the heights that work for you and, and what what you get uh, how you get the best results from that um uh, so the benefits, we all know the kind of physio, you know, the theory behind altitude training, but I think it does a couple of other things for athletes as well. Um, you know, the intensity that you can get, at, at, depending on where you go and what you're doing in the time of year. So, you know, going very high in Kenya or, or Addis in winter is a bit different to going to Poch, is different to going to uh, Boulder, you know, Laura's going to Boulder tomorrow, and going to Boulder is Boulder's not as high, or, you know, what, what you're going to do in Flagstaff, you, you uh, Park City or, or you know, so all the various heights have different impacts for people so understanding how that works is important but the, it means that athletes can get a really I think a really good chunk of, of, of intensity that just puts a little bit pressure or a little bit less pressure uh, on on the, the if you like the hard system you know muscles bones and all the rest of it but from a um, cardiovascular point of view you're getting all of those other benefits so um and again, getting the balance right is important. Yeah, yeah. And I think the other thing is people though is the, 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 the problem you have with altitude though is that it, it isn't, it's a bit like the shoes, you know, it first of all it doesn't work for everybody. And secondly, you have to use it well. You know, you've got to think about when you're using it and not just this idea that oh, I'm going to go to altitude training, I'm going to altitude training, and that means I'm going to run well. It right. doesn't mean that. So what you do when you're there, when you go, where you put that into your blocks of training is really important. One of the most frustrating things over the last eight to 10 years around our whole endurance program has been that we were trying to plan, and you do, you have to plan these things a year, two years in advance, you know when championships are, you're trying to work out when these blocks are gonna be. And yet every year we get asked in November or December about, you know, <laughs> are you thinking about going, you go, well, yeah, we made our decision a while back, you know, but why, why, are, you only, why are you only asking athletes or telling which athletes can go that those questions should have been done the previous, you know, like now, May, June, you should be planning next year's cycles. Anyway, don't get me going on that. So, uh, but yes, altitude, very important. Um, and yeah, I, you know, I, 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 I'm a big advocate of it. Good. Um, uh, welcome to uh, James T now. I think James T's with us. Evening, everyone. Evening. Oh, oh hello. There just, you are. So, okay. I'm not sitting up or we need to just tell you. <laughs> okay, James. Hey. Um, let's let's start with you this time. Let's let's move move on from the winter to, to uh, uh, the pre competition period. Uh, it, this to me is is a very very important. It is almost uh, whether you use it for March and April. I think they're so important months. But can you tell us what you do? It's always that um, that transition, isn't it? I'm, I'm sure all the coaches here are in that. Uh, slight period now where you know you, you're, you're trying to get that balance right I think you know 
when I jumped on the call listening to Steve talk about, you know, the, the aerobic component of the event is so vital, but, but then it's also that transition into, you know, depends how you've you know, periodized or, or kind of, you know, blocked your training, but you know, it is, it is that time of year where you're starting to get a little bit sharper um, challenging in the UK sometimes is the weather sometimes at the moment. So we, we had nice weather last week. It's a bit more challenging this week. Looks like it's going to be a little bit nicer next week. Um, and it's also depending on, you know, whether you've got athletes that are, you know, looking at obviously you know, the real major championships is that can be often, you know, sometimes later on in the summer. This year, it's obviously, you know, for, um, for, for those that obviously look at Olympics, it, it kind of, you know, sat bang in the middle of the summer as well. So, you know, you've obviously got when those different athletes are open at different times. So, again, if you've got larger groups, um, if you're looking after one or two athletes, it's slightly different. But, you know, I've got some that are opening, obviously, Trafford next week. Um, so, yeah, so it's just starting to sharpen, sharpen a little bit what they're doing. But, you know, probably looking at around about a month away from the, the next big one for them would be obviously Watford Grand Prix and then uh, Olympic trials, age group champs. Um, yeah, so it's always a, it's always a little bit of a, a nervy time now. So um, where you're just trying to get that balance right, um, because obviously you know you, you're just uh, you know increasing increasing some of the speed in some of the workouts, but you know obviously not too much too soon. Um, you don't want to eat, don't want to take away too much of the endurance as well, because obviously you know you don't want to go one way or the other. So I think that's what makes the the fifteen yeah. and, and also that's, the eight hundred that we point. talked about. It's such a such a balance between you know, obviously being quick enough, but also being strong enough and, and keeping that aerobic profile. So, um, yeah, it, it's spinning those plates as always. Good. Norman, any specific work you do? Norman? Oh, well, uh, I um, follow the, 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 the sort of various paces of work. I mean, Steve mentioned that... Um, you know, your top class, anybody really, who wants to run a PB 1500 has got to be in good 3K shape, good 8 shape. Now, at the end of the winter, obviously most of the athletes are in good 10K shape. So I've got to gradually drop in these other paces and bring in um, specific sessions. I might be, it's over a two week period, there might be six training sessions in there and um, they'll be more endurance orientated in the middle of March than they're going to be as, as we approach the racing season and so that just before the first competitions kick off which might be late april i've got maybe i've certainly got some one or two 15s in there and i have one eight session in there one three k and, and one, possibly one or two other endurance sessions but again a lot depends on what balance i need for that athlete as uh, uh, as we've, we've heard a few people mention one or two people may be slightly short of endurance. They've had niggles, they've had problems. So I have to rebalance for each of them as we go along. So that's where I am. And obviously, we're just approaching the uh, competition period now, and uh, <laughs> uh, which I'm looking forward to. We'll find out if it's worked uh, next week, a week today, uh, it's at Trafford. Good. Mark, anything different there? Well, yeah, as it's, I think it's a dangerous time, you know, uh, it's a bit like going going in the gym. You feel good if you haven't done it for a while, and you you overdo it. And the same thing with the, with with track or speed work. And um, I tend to mix some um, sessions with some tempo, some hills, and then short sprints, and then do what would be faster sessions on the grass, and then get them to put the spikes on a little bit on the grass, and then exactly the same with the track. Only part a, a few reps in spikes because it frightens me just going straight into a 1500 meters, never having put spikes on at the beginning of the season or a 5,000 even worse. I think it's probably a bit better, better now if you've, got the, you've invested in the, the new shoes, because I think the recovery is a bit better, but you don't want to cripple people this time of the year. So I think it's, um, it's worth designing a few sessions, which just naturally get you used to that. I don't know what the others think about that. Good. Good. Okay. Fine. I guess let's just move on a bit. So you, you've, all of you have mentioned competition. Really, so we're we're now entering the competition period. Um, what I would like to talk a bit about, and go through this and some ideas a bit on the psychological side, because of uh, the third lap, is that a problem? Steve, <laughs> did you ever have, have any problems with the third lap in the fifteen? <laughs> well, I never lost count, if that's what you're asking. Um... <laughs> I, I think when you're young, when you're a young developing athlete, that that's the bit of the race that everybody as you're doing now. You know, you kind of go, oh, you know, the third lap's the hardest lap. 
Um, I used to, I, I think I fairly quickly, to me it was probably the most important lap, oddly enough. I mean, of course the finishes, but I didn't mind where I was in lap one and two. Last, don't mind. Lap three was about putting myself, if it's a slow race, was about putting myself into the position I knew I needed to be in before I got to the bell to try and win the race, control the race, whatever. If it was a hard race, um, it was about setting myself up so that if I was after a good time, don't go lazy on the third lap. You know, you're not, you can't get it all back on the last lap. So the third lap was a, was a, was a really crucial one for me. And I used, to, I think, <clears throat> I used to, um, and, and, and sometimes more tactically than anything else. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And I, I think people ignore it a little bit, perhaps, because it, it's just like, you know, they grow up being told it's the hardest lap and can get a bit fearful of it and try and just sort of survive the third lap. The amount of times I see 15 minute runners push and shove on laps one and two to be in a good position, you know, and when it really doesn't matter. And then on the third lap, let people go by them and get themselves in a rotten place and, 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 and then struggle to, to get out of it. So, yeah, I think it's a crucial lap. Treat it importantly. It's to set your race up either to be in the right position tactically to be able to do whatever it is that you want to do on the last lap, but why give anyone a head start? First of all, it doesn't mean you have to be in the lead, but you know, don't, don't be giving people head starts if it's slow and don't <clears> be in a position where you're going to have to expend energy you don't need to do by being in the wrong place. Yep. And then, or if you're going for a fast time, work the bloody third lap. Steve, can I ask you a question leading on from that? Yeah. Two, two of... The most memorable races of yours that I can think of are one of the, when you were quite young, the 83 world champs, when you, you won the 1500. And you took it on quite a long way out. And also the uh, world record against a Wheater. What was yeah, well, they, the, both of those things just go what I just said. Yeah. So you, <clears throat> um, I mean, I still, I think I still ran 53 something for the last lap with a Wheater, but, but, You've got to set that up. You know, you can't, you, you, you've got, if you go to, I mean, we, if I talk about that one first, I mean, I don't know you talk about that, you could pick a whole bunch of other races, but uh, it was a little bit slow to 1,000 meters. It had been, actually, if people don't realize that Said and I weren't, it, the race was set up for Cruz. Cruz was in the race as well. Everyone forgets that. And Cruz, it was his first big 1500 after winning in 84, and he was going for the record. And both Said and I were raising our eyebrows, going, Oh, that's good. Um, but actually, so we were kind of following him early, and then he, he quickly went. So it, it had slowed a little bit. So, yes, then you go, Right, I've got to take this on now. In the, in the tactical race, um, which I guess Said was in as well, the one you talked about in 83, I mean, a little bit similar. You know, I remember I was last around the first 400, I think we ran like 71. But that's okay. Because if it can be last when they're running 71, because you're still only four yards off the front. Um, and actually by being last or sitting on off the off the pack, you're not blocked in or anything like that. So I'd, you know, I'd much rather in a very slow race, I'd much rather be there, gradually moving then on that third lap, as you said. You know, my plan was always if Saeed Awito didn't take it out, which he actually did. I mean, you're probably thinking that I, I didn't take it out. He took it out on the third lap. Uh, I didn't actually pass him until 200 to go, but that was also a key thing to do then as well because I just felt him, you know, normally a lot of people I think would sit and wait at that point because we were already, we'd already run a hard 400, there's still 200 to go, but I just felt him slow slightly and I didn't want to run that wide around the bend, so I slipped by him and, and obviously stayed strong in the, in the rest of it. But what it meant was I wasn't giving... Scott, Ian, Ovet, and others the chance to come hard by waiting another 100 metres. So, um, yeah, you know, look, as I said, third lap, I mean, it's actually a really good question, then. I'd be interested to hear what you know, James and the others think, but uh, it gets frustrating when you see athletes cross the line. Um, I've got to be careful because Laura might end up watching this. You know, poor Laura's run four minutes exactly, I think four times, all right? And she's been within um, a gnat's whisker uh, three or four times. So, and I'm not on about four minutes point nine. You know, I mean four minutes point one zero, almost it. And 
I joke with her a little bit and go, nah, third lap. You know, I mean, it, it, of course it isn't, because psychologically people aren't thinking that way and they're giving every single, and I would say Laura is probably a, a very good example of an athlete who always gives uh, you know, every last ounce. But walking off the track going, ah, you know, if only, if only, and it, I just see it so many times in that part of the race where you just, it's hard, of course it is, it's getting hard, you're getting to tell, but, but keep on it then, you know, because that's where, you know, come back to Mark's question, that's where you win, you win the times and it's where you win the races as well. Or can win the race. Good. I've got to ask, just, just on that, I'll finish off with Steve. In, in 1980, uh, the 1500, where you were extremely young, <laughs> um, it was a slow pace, and then Straub hit it on the third lap, didn't he? And I think that caught out a lot of people uh, on that, if you can remember. Yeah, I, just if, for, for the people out there who maybe are younger or, or uh, and for some of the older ones as well, I mean, that's a fascinating example. But it, it, uh, I ran against a guy called Graham Williamson. And uh, I get talked about a lot in Corona Vet and all that. So you wonder about how young I was. So I got the third spot ahead of Graham at the time. Graham had spanked my ass as a junior. He was the number one in the world, and I was number two in the world. Um, but I couldn't beat him. And it was Jimmy and my dad that worked out a way to do it. Um, because what Graham's tactic was as juniors, we weren't, he was so strong. Third lap, bang, like Stroud did. Graham would go so hard on the third lap because he didn't have great pace. So he made himself stronger. And of course, that's the lap. And I think I should probably thank him because I think for the rest of my senior career, that's why it became an important lap because I was like, I can't keep this up. And he would open a gap. And then that gap would pretty much stay the same on the last lap. And he was strong enough to hang on to it. But he would break. And then sometimes when I tried to go with him, it would break me completely. So I wasn't as strong as him. So we were doing a match where Graham and I were, we were both 18, but we were Britain's, we were the senior team uh, for the match. In those days where you, it was four countries, two from each country. So there was eight guys in the row. But I knew what Graham was going to do. And so we pretty much very easy first two laps. And what Jimmy, my dad said, look, when he goes hard, don't go with him, but just sit five meters back. Because what I, what I always felt with Grim is when I went with him, he went harder. You know, when, when you're right on his shoulder, he'd be going, right, you know, and he'd, he'd go a little bit harder. And that, I couldn't cope with that. So I actually sat off five to eight meters and stayed more comfortable within what I was happy with. But I didn't let him get completely away. And when I got to 300 to go, I just gradually started reeling him in. And when I caught him around the top bend, it had never happened before. He looked at me as, oh, what are you doing? But, but you know, I, came, I went past him and went on to win. And Graham never, ever beat me again. No, I think, I, I, think, I, think uh, yeah. I, was, I was in the stadium in Athens in 82 um, when uh, Graham went down yeah. and you looked up at the screen and you went. Um, yeah, uh, that's a, that's a different thing. That is Neville. That that's race. You know, reacting and picking it, um, committing to something, which yeah. wasn't in the plan. No, I wasn't far off the plan. The plan was actually to go from five hundred out, and then it's sure just yeah. just less, just over six hundred. Fall, everybody kicks around. I took a look around. I had a three three meter lead because everyone fell sort of behind me, or, or didn't let Graham fell, but there was a bit of and. Your adrenaline, when that happens, you just get a shoot of adrenaline. And I was like, right, I'm off. Yeah, I was regretting it with 50 meters to go. I mean, I was waddling in a, in a sea of laughter and thinking, <laughs> no, they're going to catch me. Yeah. But yeah, the, the, that, that's a little bit different. You know, that, that's just reacting. To Good. Do, we, do we talk to our athletes about tactics very much, Norman? Um, well, I'm not sure about all coaches, but I think um, we should because, as you say, if athletes um, have got problems with the third lap, maybe they've not got the tactics um, right. Yeah, often you, you can see it often with the younger athletes, and really, it's the the relationship between the athlete and the coach. They should be getting their heads together two days before the race to discuss plan A, plan B, plan C. Obviously, it depends on um, whether the, the tactics are going to be quite different from an athlete who may be slowest in the race. To one who's expected to win, yeah. but um, I think it's important so I, younger athletes can I ask to start through the James tactics. James and Mark and Andrew are more, you know, worked in a, in a 
a different era a little bit in terms of obviously racing and that but more coaching now. I'm always curious as to what and this is not for goodness sake doing you know we're doing it on a BMC conference here. But whether or not um, the chase for times, if you like, is much more prevalent now that athletes you know, want their coach to always, they always want to go into races to run fast and don't necessarily want to learn the craft of, because let's face it, when you get to a championships, you still got to get out of the heat um, and PBs don't count for much. So I'm just curious as to whether or not they feel with a lot of the athletes they work with now that there's just this idea of always, you know, I'm running that race to run quick. I think um, I think tax. I think it's a really um, a hot subject, uh, Neville and, and, and Steve. I, I think that um, you know we've got a job to really discuss and, and teach and educate uh, younger athletes about, as Steve said, the craft of racing. And and and, and, and the thing is, it's, it can be quite different to eight and fifteen. Oh, absolutely, oh, absolutely. Yeah, and, uh, especially if it's heats or whatever. I remember you know with Matt Rimmer, for instance, at times um, he's up against guys who are maybe eight inches taller than him and, you know, two or three stone heavier. And uh, he had to be in the right places with 150 to go, let's say, so he didn't get knocked about. I mean, it's just even individual, um, you know, aspects like that that uh, you've got to bring bring into the discussion. Well, as just Steve said, it, you've got to educate um, from a yeah. young age so that they can take all of this on board and learn this craft. Yeah. Take James, you, you are probably... Uh, well, you know, you raced not that long ago. Um, you you were quite a good tactical race racer, if I remember in the championships. I, I was okay. I, I wasn't. I wasn't great, but I I learnt my craft a lot through things like British League events. That you know, I got the chance to. You know, you didn't know who you were racing against always, and you had to think in your feet. The other thing I feel really fortunate. I mean, um, we had quite a lot of uh, match races as under twenty threes against. The, the you know France Germany um, different nations where there would just be six of you on the start line and again you wouldn't have much detail about the other athletes you know about the other British or you know the the uh, maybe one or two of them but it, it just taught you a little bit about you know a bit about racecraft um, about you know different paces whether it was um, you know going out slow whether someone took that third lap on. Um, but I think, yeah, going back to the kind of, you know, expectations as, as coaches and athletes, I think that I definitely think coaches, you know, especially with younger athletes, um, that they, they, you know, get them into as many different types of events. I think what we do at British Miners Club is absolutely fantastic with obviously, you know, there are fast races, but you often see some people, if a pacemaker doesn't turn up, um, their heads suddenly drop or they suddenly worry or panic. But I always think it's a great thing sometimes with the athletes that we've got unless they're really chasing the qualifying time, because it gets them to think on their feet. Yeah. Um, they, they've got to obviously adapt around it. So I, I think, you know, we, we complement obviously, you know, really important part because, you know, to, you know, ultimately you want to run fast in this sport. You know, you want to run as fast as you can, but in an age group, in a, in a you know, obviously senior level, um, unless you can get through the heats of your championships, your, your UK champs, you, you're not even going to be in the final if you've not got any racecraft, then you're not going to be competitive in the final either. So it's that ingredients. It's also taking the pressure off sometimes in terms of every race you stand on the start line, you're trying to run a personal best. There comes a point where, especially as a developing athlete or when you get to a senior level, that's not going to happen. So it's actually, I always used to love tactical races and, and times going out the window and not even worrying about times, but it being a real kind of, you know, head to head, uh, battle and and therefore about skill and about position and you know about you know jostling and you know and holding your your your, your space. Um, so I think yeah, it's kind of feeding into athletes that you know that's a really important part. Yeah. I think at the moment last you know year because we've missed some of the age group champs, missed the champs. It's been about running fast. Um, yeah, I, I suggested yeah whether you know we um, even at some point I think we did once upon a time have a British Milers Club final. Um, that was that, that I think was unpaced at some time, or, or other, I'm sure Norman or the guys could point me if that has happened. But and actually promote head-to-head -head racing. So uh, yeah, we, we have done it occasionally, Matt. But there's a problem, and um, if we don't put on reasonably paced races, fast races, athletes from a distance don't turn up. It's only local athletes will turn up. 
And um, so that can happen in um, you know some of the gold standard uh, meets. But you know, I I think um, it's often when I, I get introduced to a new athlete, you know, a new athlete comes into the group, and I want to talk tactics uh, to them. You know, I'll, I'll maybe ask them the question. You know, about what what's the difference between let's say with 150 to go, going for the line, and 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 alternatively not allowing anybody to come past. And, and they're often flummoxed by this, you know, a little bit. They don't understand the difference. And there's a big difference, as we all know. And that's what, one of the things that uh, young athletes have to learn you know, about distributing their energy and the moves. Andy, you want to comment on this tactic? I mean, I think the biggest conversations I have with the athletes is they, they too get too fixated on running fast times. And I think that is their downfall sometimes instead of just going out into the race and racing the race. Because generally, if you get into a good fast race and you win the race, you end up with the win as well as a fast time. Um, and I do just try and encourage them to focus on racing the race. So whether it is in a BMC race or a championship race, it's just getting, you know, just focusing on that side of stuff. Um, but, you know, I work with students and, um, you know, and it's a little bit harder to, I, I only get three years with them, but um, I, I'd like to think by the third year that, that they learn that um, eventually. But the other good thing that I've got as well is I've, I've worked with a couple of youngsters. So, you know, as well, and, and, and part of their development is um, when they're at the right age is to throw them into the deep end and run with seniors and, um, you know, and really learn their, their, their race craft the hard way as well and um you know there's a, there's a couple of guys that i've got and i've done that with and um um and i'm, I'm hoping that as they move through into senior ranks that they'll benefit a, a heck of a lot from that as well um and being pushed around and and, and jostled and um you know because I, I sometimes these athletes are too good for their age groups and and um you know, and things are too easy. And that's why I just like to, you know, throw them in the deep end and... and, yeah, and yeah, yeah. Right, just, well, there's, well, there's just a few, few more minutes to go. Uh, we haven't mentioned physiological testing. Um, I don't know if Steve had physiological testing in his days, but uh, it's quite appropriate now. I mean, Norman does it up at Manchester. I know James does it in Cardiff. And he does it at... Uh, at, at Leeds and Mark does it down at this place and there's a lot goes on at Canterbury uh, and, and St Mary's. Any comments on, on physiological logical testing? Well, it was Steve's subject at university, wasn't it? Yeah. It was, Steve, it was Steve's subject at university. Uh, it, 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 was it? It wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't my subject, but it was, it, uh, I did end up doing my dissertation on yeah. training. I, so I, I went within what I was doing, I went down the science route a bit. Um, and, and I think I tried to help develop some of the testing protocols because it was pretty rubbish and the machinery was rubbish and blah, blah, blah. I had a massive argument with um, uh, the physiology, uh, one of the lecturers, um, that he claimed the lactate levels that we were getting on the treadmill. And I said to him, you need to come and see me doing 12 times 400. I am not reaching anywhere near the lactate levels that I do. And he said, that's rubbish. You're running, you're running here. I said, no, no. I said, all I'm having on the treadmill here, the protocol, is that I can't keep up with the treadmill anymore. I said, I could keep running if you just slowed it down a little bit. He goes, oh, that's not how the protocol works. And I went, well, I could keep yeah. going and my, and my lactates will keep going up because I'll just get a, maybe a tad slower. Or you know. So I made him come down a freezing cold night in Jarrow one night in March or April with all these little and you know, pin pricks on my fingers and, and he went home and the next day it was great. All, every, all of my fellow students cheered and said, because he admitted I was right, but anyway. Um, I think, <coughs> and, and I'll throw this back to the guys because it's been much more part of the lives, but it is you know, as a coach now as well. And I'm, I'm always interested in reading and talking to, to athletes and coaches when I'm, when I'm away working. Um, <clears throat> anything like this, you know, you have to really, really understand uh, how it works and how to apply it. Um, <coughs> and testing is only valid if it's done regularly and if, if it's part of your program. Because the odd test every, you know, 18 months 
it, 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 it's interesting, but it's not really useful because those little snapshots are not what you're after. You're after looking for the trends. You're looking for the information that, that in the same way that you would look at through training, you would never, ever look at one track session and go, that person's going to do X because you don't have the full picture. So the key to me about testing is that it's done on a pretty regular basis. And as an athlete develops through the career, you can, you can contrast, compare, and all the rest of it, either, either within the, the cycle you're in or, or more you know, over, over a longer period. So, and the problem for all of us is we're not, we don't, I mean, Andy and, and James are quite lucky, I guess. If you're in a setup where that's available, that's great. But for a lot of athletes, it's not available. So I think where it goes wrong sometimes is somebody gets offered the chance to get testing, they go along and have it. Either the coach, you know, maybe isn't as up, up to speed with what understanding what, what the information means, and then they never go back for another year or, or, or 18 months. Good, good. Okay. Um, that sums up physiological testing pretty well, I think. So <laughs> what I think is is, <laughs> is to wind up the session and yes, quickly let's go around the table. If anybody, uh, we've got Steve here now, as I said before, one of the all-time greats um, uh, globally, not just, just British. Um, anybody wish to ask Steve a question? Yeah, I will. Steve, um, I can remember when you, you ran that 357 for the mile, it was the MC Car Mile, where you qualified for the Commonwealth Games. Mm -hmm. And um, that was, I think you were 17, weren't you? Mm -hmm. After that, from a motivation point of view, did you have dips where you thought, I can't do this anymore, I want to give up, I don't, I don't appreciate the lifestyle? Um, oh, God. That's yeah. deep. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. When I was about thirty-three, um, <laughs> no, you know, I mean, what it, what what it did was it, it, it rather you know earlier than I was expecting. It opened the door that we all all athletes want to go step through, you know. And I went from you know a schoolboy, oh, well, I was still a schoolboy, and and without you know extending this story too much, people probably know I, I was it was the Durham Schools Championships. At, at, 10 days before where I'd run 3.42 because I was annoyed at one of the teachers who hadn't entered me and during school said they weren't going to pick me. I thought I'll run so fast to get day not. So I front ran a 3.42. Got a telegram, remember them, to run the MZ Car Mile, ran 357. And uh, most people will know who Andy Norman is, uh, the older people anyway, came up to me afterwards. I think it's Bren's, um, because Bren and Foster picked me on the line probably a little bit of Bren's behest. And because Cornel Vett had chosen to do the European Championships, Tim and I, Tim Hutchings and I, uh, were both asked, Tim was 19, I was 17, if we'd like to go to Commonwealth Games. And what that did was it just, it, yeah, it, it's the whole lick of the ice cream thing. You know, I, people might forget I finished last in my heat, but I learned so much in those four weeks I was there from other athletes, from being in the championships, um, which stood me in such great stead. It wasn't all, you know, a steep upward curve from there. The following year, um, I struggled with A-levels because I wasn't going to school anymore. I always thought I was, you know, I was went off training here, there and everywhere. Didn't get the A-level results I wanted, which actually in the end might have been a good thing because I would have ended up at Loughborough. Um, uh, but, but I didn't think that didn't happen. Um, but I ended up at home. But that year was a hard year. I think I remember I told you earlier on I was struggling to run much quicker. I ran three thousand. You know, I did win the European Juniors at three thousand. Um, you know, and then then the following year I went to the Olympics. But it was all you know. Mm. You, any athlete, any athlete, no matter how good how good they are, uh, how talented they are, you know what what they you know, you you have to learn to take the longer term view particularly with young athletes. You know, this is a sport which can give you an awful lot, but you've got to hang in there. 14, 15, 16-year-olds, well, certainly 12, 13, 14-year-olds. One of the things when they ask me, I just say, just keep doing it. Because when you're 18, 19, most of the people around you will have stopped for whatever reason. And it's a little bit the same even at, at the higher levels. You know, you those downs teach you a lot about yourself. You know, when it's not going well, when you're injured, 
you know, the people around you becoming more important, um, the coach, your, the environment, your athletics club, um, all of those things will keep you involved long enough. And you'll find out whether you want to, you know, keep going and, and, yeah. and you know, get some of the things which, which I was lucky enough to get. Uh, had I not got some of those things, I don't think I would have been any less of a person or anything. I would have worked as hard to come, you know, fifth or fourth. The problem, I think, became later in my career when you've done all of that. You know, when you've set the standard, that's when the motivation becomes hard. And that's why I quit. I didn't quit because I couldn't keep doing it. I quit because I knew I wasn't, I didn't, it wasn't that I didn't care. It had become a business. And that that wasn't what I I've been doing it for you know 12, 13 years, and that it become the, there's nothing wrong in coming fifth at the Olympic Games. You know, it's bloody great, isn't it? But if you've won a medal before, and there's nothing wrong with running 333, that's bloody good as well. And if you've run 329 and you know you're never gonna run that again, quite hard to stay quite motivated in those coming back to what we were talking about before, those mm-hmm. women and and things. So I think it's just that I I sort of it was only in those last two or three years, lots of injuries, lots of frustration. Um, and, you know, that it was the, the body was the initial bit that wasn't playing ball. And then eventually, once, once that stops, though, once you stop really, really wanting to do it and, and stop caring about, you should care whether you come seventh rather than eighth. And you should care whether you come sixth rather than seventh, because that's what, that's what it's about. And of course, you care whether you win or you come second. Um, and when you stop caring, um, all of those are perfectly valid reasons to run. But when you stop caring about that, then then yeah, it's, the training becomes quite hard. Neville, can I ask a, a question? Yes. Yes. Okay. I mean, the question I was going to ask Steve, we could probably occupy for about half an hour here. I think easily. Oh, great! Thank you. <laughs> but uh, it, but and I know that you, 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 we haven't got a lot of time. But you've talked about. You know, how important the endurance work is. And just to remind people, you know, you, you regularly throughout the winter ran at least two, not exactly you might call them sessions, but two six-mile efforts um, it, per week at five-minute mileing pace. You know, we call them tempo runs today. And um, you took some of these with you in, into the summer. And what I wanted to just ask you was, you know, what specifically you, you did and when, you know, when did you do it? Um, what sort of training you did? To, to look at endurance maintenance in the summer, during the summer months. You know, it's very okay, critical. Well, it? Yeah, some I, people I, lose it easily. You yeah, didn't. No, you I, obviously I, got some, I, something right there. I did a lot of running a lot, quite a bit faster than that even, I think. Um, yeah. I think most of my training in the winter would probably come into two, <clears throat> yeah, what you call tempo now, but I think more like what you would call a progression run now. A lot of my runs, we'd start out at a certain pace and it just got quicker and quicker and quicker and quicker. And the last two miles might be, you know, 430, 440 pace. Wow. I'm not exaggerating. Now, mm-hmm. to be fair, maybe I didn't know, maybe I'll, you know, we didn't have garments and all the rest of it. But that, that was based on years of people running the same routes and all the rest of it. And it didn't matter what the pace was, really. Um, I think what I did a lot of kind of march onwards was... For instance, we had a run called the Tech. The Tech was about four miles. Um, or f- sorry, about four, nearly four and a half, four, four point two or three, I think we eventually got measured at. We used to just call it four miles, but it took 21, 22 minutes flat out. So it was, now I say flat out, as I got better over the years, so it, uh, there'd be a lot of, as I said, you'd call a 10 four run. And people yeah. now would go, oh, you run for a four mile run, but it was out the door, bang, Right. Um, you know, five minute miling or quicker. The high end of tempo. Yeah. Yeah, but it but it but it didn't feel that that's exactly what I'd say that your description was keeping in touch with. Yeah. But hey, you know, you still did the long runs. Um let you know, not as long in the winter, sorry, in the summer. I I would say my mileage would go down as much as to your know, fifty miles a week. Right. Good. Right. Um, Good. James, we, we missed that out of the article all those years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, th- I think it, you, you know, and I mean, just to touch on it. So, and, and this, I mean, I know guys might have a quick question, but my big, my big, big thing, which I think I did pretty well, 
And I like to think I've done with Laura, I tried to do with Laura. You know, this, getting, getting yourself ready for when you want to be ready is so important. Yeah. James yeah. talked about young athletes, you know, trying to make, you know, uh, age group teams. It might be the English schools championships, it might be whatever it is. So what you, you were talking about the transition time of the season, it's going to be different for different people. And then how you use that, and, and uh, Andy was talking about athletes wanting to get out on the track in the first race, or, you know, what, what am I going to run? You know, how am I going to run faster? So the idea of this progression towards the target, and yes, you know, if you're going to the Olympics, you've got to take Olympic trials in and all the rest of it. So there's sometimes got to be a double, almost a double peak, if you like, if you can do it. But, and, and you might have two champs in the season, but I just sometimes over the years have thought, I don't see enough of that. You know, I just don't see enough of the planning. Yeah. That, so, so, hey, you know, if, you miss, if you're flying in February, great, well done you. You know, but if you don't make the team in the summer, we're all going to forget about what you were doing in February. Yeah. And, you know, so I think, you know, I'll, I'll go back to Laura. Um, when she first asked me to coach her, and I've been working with her for two, three months, she got, she'd been kicked off the Futures program because she was told she wasn't going to be any good. Um, which is always great for a 17, 18 year old athlete to be told that. Um, she, you know, she was told she wasn't quick enough. Wow. Um, and then um, she didn't get selected for the European Juniors. Um, I, I, I think Charlie Perdue was going to double up and, and then ended up end not doubling up. Anyway, whatever. And that's fine. That's, these are the sort of things athletes have to cope with, don't they? Yeah. And I said to her, look, what I, you know, one thing you have to learn is that you cannot, you cannot expect anything. You have got to put yourself always in the position where don't allow others to make decisions on your behalf. Never give the selectors a reason not to pick you. Okay? Sure. You might not be good enough, but let's not do anything that, that, that you know, we do absolutely everything. Get the qualifying time, finish in the top two in the trials if that's what you have to do. Um, and, and that you do not. So don't rely on. And, and actually, I don't really mind what we're doing in May because it's part of the plan to run well in June and July and August or whatever it might be. So this, the idea that, um, I mean, thankfully, we haven't missed the championships. And the only times that she hasn't performed at championships when she tripped over her own feet and banged her head on the ground in, in Beijing and when she ripped her leg at the trials in, in 2013. And I think... I, I, some, you know, I've talked to a lot of other guys around this you know, the last five, ten years. The good athletes, the Mo Farahs, the Usain Bolts, the, the, it doesn't matter if you're getting beaten. In, in, it, you know, there's a time of the year where it just doesn't matter. Do your thing, that, but, but it's your plan to get you ready for when you want to get, you know, when you want to run well. Running flashy times and flashy performances in races and meets that, you know, and then you don't make the team, you know, so yeah, yeah um, that was one of the things which I was, I was uh, during my career, I was always a bit like that as well. Yeah. So yeah. I didn't stress too much. Um, nobody likes getting beat by people you don't want to get beat from, but but if it's at a time of the year, it's not so important. Then. Good. Okay. I think really we've covered most of uh, most of fifteen hundred meters, um, and I'd last like to uh, uh, thank Steve. Uh, for making a major contribution. Thanks, that was really Sorry for hogging me, but I wanted to hear what James had to say. Steve, I've got one more, more quick question there. One more. Ned, one more, one more. Ned, oh, sorry, one quick question. So, Steve, you get to keep one of your races, or you get to rerun it, basically. So, oh, whether really it's Nice... Race. No, you get to, whether it's Nice, Helsinki, whether it's Oslo, whether it's the Champs de Mar, but you also get to rerun one of those that didn't go to plan again. So, which do you go for? Do you, do you go... Do you stick or twist? I, I would 100% run the 1988 Olympic final again. That's, that's, your, that's your final game. decision. You're going to go what for that. What would you, and what would you do? What would you do differently? Um, I'd, 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 well, well, it would be a physical and a mental thing. I would. I wouldn't have. Um, I wouldn't have been as lacking in confidence because I have no idea. Well, I do know why. Because I've been injured, um, and because I was lacking in a bit of confidence. Remember that third lap thing? I got myself into the worst mess. Not just me, Peter did as well, Peter Elliott. You know, uh, Peter or I should have won that race. I've never been beaten by Peter and ever until that race anyway, but that's another. But Peter was worthy of 
Um, and, you know, it was the worst positioning, tactical, but it was, but it was all because I wasn't thinking straight uh, in the way in which I would normally do. I didn't have to be my best to win that race. I wasn't at my best. I was, pre I was in pretty good shape. You know, in fact, I was in very good shape, but you know, getting injured in the three weeks before the games, not training, and then literally coming out into the heats as your first. And I think for the first time, uh, no, I, I'd had my arse kicked in 1987. That's another story. I won't talk about that. But, but rerun the race, you know, when you're actually in the race, you can get things wrong in preparation, can't you, in training and things. But I still was good enough on that day to have done better than four. Okay. I think we we wind it up there. Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you very much, uh, everyone, for taking part in a very most useful uh, conference talk that we've had. It's really, really good to see and uh, say um, we hope everything goes well for you all in the summer. And I think really uh, British Middle Distance, and particularly 1,500 metres, is in very good hands. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Neville. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good luck. Steve, could, Steve, could you just hang around a moment? I need to talk yes. to you about oh, something yeah. else. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. See Thank you, me. guys. Take care. Take Thanks care. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.